Thanks, as always, for listening to Fluff and Crunch. In this week's episode, Chris and I offer up two separate fiction properties as fodder for ideas for campaign settings or adventures. And we're betting that maybe you haven't heard of these, so this will actually be new to you. Thanks, as always, for listening. Thanks for listening to Fluff and Crunch, where we talk about the connection and sometimes disconnect between system, setting, and story in tabletop RPGs. There we go. We're recording. Hello, Chris. How are you? I'm good, thanks. How are you? I'm all right. I'm all right. I'm trying to... I'm hoping that I'm going to dodge the cold that my wife has. So, that's life. Had a good uh, Thanksgiving weekend, though, and um, had another session of our Castles and Crusades Kingmaker, uh, moving things along, making some discoveries, meeting friends, maybe making some enemies, all that good stuff. How about you? Uh, yeah, yeah, I had a pretty decent weekend. We played a, played the same board game we played before, and then it was Annie's birthday. We went go-karting on Saturday. Oh, that that looks cool. She had her, she had her cool like race car driver suit on. Yeah. Yeah, so that was uh <laughs> that's yeah. Uh so so today we're going to look at we, we to 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 get in blah, 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 blah. you queue it up. <laughs> um so yeah, I did when when we uh, we have to sit down and come up with this episode. We don't uh, contrary to I don't know if it's contrary to popular belief. No one ever says this. No one has ever criticized it. This is just this isn't a popular. But some people may just think we make up these episodes at the drop of the hat. We don't. We have a long ass list of uh, of potential episode ideas, yeah. uh, and uh, we get sometimes we get to the point where we have like you know. 20 30 ideas and it's like brilliant we're sorted and then it's only you work your way through those ideas and occasionally get to point me like oh we're running short we need more ideas and so when we do that we come up with like new new uh like series so like when we did the system spotlight idea where we would do an episode talking yeah. about property in detail and then we do a second episode doing 2d20 and we've done you know we've done a reasonable amount of them mm-hmm. uh, so my new idea was oh that essentially we'll it's kind of like bring it bring a book to school day yeah. um except we're not necessarily doing but well, you're doing books because you've picked nothing but books you're right i didn't i have i have not picked nothing you have but a books. variety of properties nothing. yeah the idea we would bring a we would bring a property and we would explain the property explain the story if there's a story with it because presumably we're not just turning up with setting so probably right. setting story characters and then a quick why we think this would be a good role-playing game it didn't have to be a setting because it could be a one-off. I think there's definitely yeah. we've talked about it before. Some properties are better as one-offs, and some are good as campaigns. Mm-hmm. So these may um, be fi- these are fictional properties with which yes. you might not be familiar, and uh, maybe you maybe you get turned on to these things uh, for the sake of just reading or watching or playing, uh, or it's something that you end up doing that with, and you go, "Huh, I'm going to use this in a game," or "I'm going to." I mean, let's face it: uh, there is virtually nothing new under the sun, and. Yeah. As a GM, if you are not being inspired by, read, stealing from existing properties that that interest you, then you're giving yourself headaches and gray hairs that you don't need. So, exactly. so what we're going to do today is Chris is going to uh, talk about. Well, I'm going to ask him a bunch of questions about one, and then I'm going to talk about one. So we're going to provide you with two different properties today, uh, with some background on it and our thoughts about how it could fit for gaming and these are not these are things that i know that we chose because we think they do have legs yes, yeah. for gaming purposes yeah so, so jeremy had actually picked one last week and then we decided we did, did we did a different episode um i i have written a list but i couldn't decide which one so i i am going to attempt to with the modern technology i'm going to attempt to share my screen <laughs> And roll this wheel of names that. And I if have. you're only and... listening and not watching, Chris has this wonderful like uh, wheel of fortune thing behind him <laughs> in his virtual background, and he's spinning it now. No, because Jeremy oh. needs to enable screen sharing. Oh, I need to do that. It's got Oops. all hit it because this is authentic. Now people know that we're not making this crap, but well, we are making. You know what I mean? You could, I could, I could, you can see this. I'm hoping that it's spinning. I'm about oh, to have a seizure. Oh, go on, keep going. Oh, thank goodness. <laughs> So Kipo wins. Oh, this will be an interesting one to talk about. Okay. So now All this right. is great because okay. I have no idea what a Kipo is. All right. So um, what is a, what the heck is Kipo? What so is it? Keep, it's the full, the full title is Kipo and the Age of Wonder Beasts. This was a, 
Uh, it's, it's, it, well, it's, kids isn't the right word. It's probably like a, a sort of a teenager, teenager type uh, type thing that me and Annie found on Netflix. I think it was during COVID. Okay. So it's a um, show. It's a, it, was, it's like, it was an animated show. Um, I'm just going to stick up the... So we now find the link for it now. Yes, it's more quality. Link. So yeah, it's an animated show. I think it was desire. It's... I mean, it was the right age for Annie. It probably it probably is meant to be a little bit older than her. The main the, the characters are all like teenagers. They never really talk about it. They're clearly the characters. It's TV. Like, I'm it's looking TV. at it. There are three seasons. Uh, it came out in 2020. TVY7, Fantasy, Violence, and Fear. And when I typed in Kipo on Netflix, the show that showed up immediately next to it is Avatar. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. It was, it's that kind of thing that, you know, you, younger kids could watch it, but older kids. I mean, I, I we really enjoyed it. So um anyway let's go over this, this so this we watched this during uh, most of this we watched during covid so what's um, the what is the, the the most the most basic elevator pitch of this as a as a story so, backdrop and the story that that that's in it so kipo is set in a post post apocalyptic world um where there's a handful of it's kind of as I go through this you'll well, some people will think of other settings but it's set in a post apocalyptic okay. world where there are some humans left um not huge amounts um but they're like they're they're the minority so that some of the main characters are humans and so like keeper is this character she starts off she's in something like a vault if you're thinking in fallout terms or something like okay. a vault and she leaves and then something happens and she leaves that um uh and most of the people most of the humans have been basically been taught that everything else in the world is terrible and awful. you should stay in that but she's something bad happens so she has to kind of go out into the world and she discovers that there are other humans around but she also discovers that loads of the other people are are, are basically mutated animals so some of these are just animals that can talk mm -hmm. um some of these are animals that are bigger you know completely different like talk, uh, lots of talking animals uh and so like the first series was her sort of just find really just finding her way now, are these animals that we would recognize yeah like, so like, like the, you know there's like insects and like you know, elevated versions of animals we yeah recognize. they massively vary between they are they're still in their normal animal form but they can talk and okay. then things that are anthropomorphized so they're like you know they're standing and they wear clothes and stuff right and, and she sees different things in different series so in the first series like one of the main characters is this kind of like bug cockroach thing that essentially can't die every time it like it, it it dies frequently, but every time it dies, it basically turns into a like a small. It like goes into a shell, and then it kind of comes out of a cocoon, and then it's just the same thing again. So we can't, he can't really die. And he's okay, kind of like funny. Um, this is like a pig I've got in my picture. He, uh, who's got like you know four sets of eyes or something. So some of them are just silly animals that are really just you know just they're slightly different. Some of them are that are intelligent. Uh, some of them are sentient. As they go through it, you start introducing more and more of the world. So there's like you know huge. Um, like, you know, they find a town and everyone in the town are like snake people and they find a town and they're all just all the different animals are living together. I think in one of the series, there's like a theme park um, where and they're all had together. But one of the main conflicts ends up being over the series, the difference between sort of humans who think, you know, they're better and the animal, almost like Planet of the Apes. Okay. Um, where, you know, they 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 don't like each other. And, Is and it... Kipo, because she's just super friendly, Kipo just wants everyone to get along. Right. She's just like, look, you know, the human civilization is destroyed. I mean, she doesn't know that because it's like... You know, it's probably thousands of years after whatever happened happened. But now, Keeper are, just wants are, everyone are to the, get along. Go on. Are the are by default are all the humans like either emerging from or have emerged from these vaults? Like, is have humans been out of the mix? No, it's this? kind of, yeah, it's kind of a mix. There's there's people who have been like so who literally they're in their little they're in their little place and they don't leave and they they are convinced everything outside is bad so they don't leave at all. And then there's other people who who have left and then there's like scavenger type people who have you know something bad happens they've had to leave and then they're like there's this girl that's been raised by wolves and she, she basically thinks she's a wolf because she was raised by wolves so you know fair enough okay. she's like Mowgli basically um so it just ends up being a big mix of like different stories and the thing that goes on top of that is that Kipo ends up finding that someone's experimented on her. So certain humans have been experimenting on animals as well. So they've been taking these intelligent animals and experimenting on them. Um, and then Kipo in the end, it's really weird. She gets these like Jaguar powers. So she can turn into this giant, like mutant Jaguar thing. But when she does, she goes a bit wild. So in one of the series, like she's almost like the bad guy of a bunch of it because she learns that she has these Jaguar powers. When she turns into this giant, you know, 30 foot long Jaguar thing, she just wrecks everything. Hmm. um and then but she she has to do that to fight against another big mutant monster that 
like because she's the only thing that can fight the other one that's just wrecking everything you know you know, it's three series so there's a whole yeah. bunch of different stuff. it looked like there were but, at least 10 episodes in the first season yeah. when i glanced at it on, um on Netflix. But it, it was it's a good it's basically it's a relatively fun setting so you know kind of reminds me of something like mutant mutant year zero where there are there are people with mutations there yeah. are animals with mutations people are little in, living in their little settlements sometimes people will you know basically go to war with them there's times where like Kiba comes along and there's like you know the snake people are fighting either like, bird people i can't remember it's like three years since i watched it and they're like in a war and but it's mostly even though there's a lot of action and fighting stuff it's all you know because it's kind of any of the kids thing it's always actually Kipo trying to like she just wants everyone to be friends and everybody else to get along and like all these oh, we're gonna kill each other because we hate everyone um it was just it was it was you know it had a it was a dice heart place but it was also there's lots of cool action stuff in there's loads of cool mutant weird stuff in um and yeah i added to what i was trying i was like i think i'd got to about seven and i was like, i want to get to ten ten's a really good number that i can work from uh and i put that on and it's it's yeah it's it's, it's there's nothing you know outstanding if you've if you've uh if you've played mutant year zero this is probably straight up that alley. Um, Although this sounds this the the you know the default of mutant year zero is pretty grim. Like your 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 mutated character is melting eventually. This I sounds mean, a little more optimistic and hopeful. I think the thing is, it's some of the characters are optimistic and hopeful, but then there's loads of other ones who are. I mean, there's lots of the problems you have is that people who will not change, right. they will not leave that. This is their wood. This is their forest. Yeah. Uh, and they won't leave. It's like there's a whole civilization of, I just remember they're living in a forest who they like worshipped a particular thing, but they had all the things wrong. You know, the kind of thing where someone's read a book and they think that book is the gospel because it's just some random book they found from the ancient times. And so they believe that is the most important thing. And okay. then someone else burns it down. Of course, they have to go to war because they've destroyed, you know, it's that kind of thing. So a lot of it is very kind of what happens when you have tribes of people that all just believe into the other stuff and, you know, they worship a frying pan or whatever. There's a lot of that. I mean, there's one episode where they find this kind of living sentient mold that's in control of this building. Um, and he just wants friends. It's like the the overall idea is it's kind of like, you know, how Star Trek will have nasty episodes. The, the yeah. main people, they're optimistic and they want everything to be okay. good and they want to help people. But like that you sometimes they just go to planets where no one wants help. Right. Sometimes they just go to planets where everyone they just want a war and you can't always. Yeah. Stop Although, you know, I, I, I think if you want. If you want some, if you want some storytelling that actually feels authentic, you, 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 I think personally, like grim all the time gets really, really old. On the other hand, like, you know, everything's sunny and happy. And there's like, let's our, what's our adventure about? We're going shopping today, you know, or we're going for a walk and nothing happens. You know, that's stupid. There's no, there's no plot. I, I like, I like that combination. Um, it's interesting actually looking at it and, and thinking about, you know, I, I've only read a little bit of uh, Dreams and Machines and uh, and it kind of evokes a little bit. It seems to at least like that there is a there's a hopefulness, like an almost like an innocent hopefulness to it. Um, and, and that's putting aside like what game would you use to to play this? But it sounds like an interesting it sounds like an interesting story. I mean, the fact that you've got uh, you have three seasons to look through to steal ideas and backdrop and look and characters from and there are plenty of games post-apocalyptic and otherwise that provide uh rules and things to pillage for you know anthropomorphized you know, elevated animals and and things like that um that's interesting yeah, and, and and if and it also sounds like by the if you were to run something in, in keeping with the vibe of the show it sounds like you could run it with a younger player audience and not have not stray from it dumb it down or like overwhelm them with like you know extreme violence or something like that like hey kids let's play 40k you know something like that uh, that's the thing it, 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 it ran it ran the whole you know spread of different stuff that because there were you know there are characters that die in it which is like mm -hmm. sad when it happens and there's you know people lose family and so there's lots of things You're like oh that's you know and there are some but then there's also lots of funny bits. You know, a lot of it, it was funny and it was comedy stuff in it. But then there was loads of, you know, there's not nasty, nasty, but like kind of like the st the times when you knew you weren't really watching a kid's show. It was it was probably more of a designed at teenagers. Um, but Annie Skew's elder show, it was fine. But yeah, it was definitely something, you know, you see the picture and you think, well, what the hell is this? All right, we'll watch this. We want another animated thing to watch. Yeah. And you're watching and you go, this is, this is not your, av this wasn't your average 
animated kiddie program. This was definitely skewing. I mean, it, it's, you're, the fact that you said it's it, the the recommendation linked to Avatar. It's exactly yeah. that. Okay. okay, Avatar and Cora is are uh, they are animated, but they're not anim. They're not little kids. Little kids could watch them and enjoy them because people make fart noise and stuff. But it's operating at like a much higher level. Yeah, I, you know, I watched this as an adult and really enjoyed it from an adult perspective, not as a oh, it reminds me as a kid kind of thing. Right. It was, it genuinely, it was good. But you know what? There, there is there is good animation like that. There's really good animation like that that it, it operates on several levels simultaneously. Um, and thus is enjoyable by a, a broad audience. That's really cool. That's really cool. So if you're not familiar with Kipo, K-I-P-O, uh, look it up. It's on Netflix. And uh, maybe we'll circle back at some point and talk about like what system would you use uh, if you were going to to model it. I think we've mentioned them already, though. I think we did, yeah. <laughs> oh, it's the one thing I did say why, sorry. I realized the one thing I did say why, why I think this would be a good, I think we kind of covered it. It's, it, this would be, I think this would be good for a role playing setting simply because there's more stories to be told here. Okay. That's one okay. of the things we mentioned. There are, there are certain settings you think the story is the, the story is the story. Right. And trying to add on to that is very difficult. There is or definitely, the okay. You know, there's a very clear, there's a starting point and then there's that, but that's kind of that little part of the world. There's clearly a lot more world out there. It would be very easy to do similar things. I mean, they mostly take place in sort of one area. So it'd be very to take ideas for this. And, you know, and if you want to play a human or a human with mutations or a or anthropomorphized animal or, you know, there'd be a whole bunch of different things. And again, in terms of how you want to do, you could be exploring, you can be doing like your classic survival game, um, mm -hmm. you could be peacemaking or you could do, do you know, a more standard you know, enemy of the week thing or, a, you know, a kind of, oh, I can't think, you know, like the Wanderer where every time, you, every week you walk into a new settlement and there's a problem. Yeah, David then, Carradine, Kung Fu. Exactly. So every week there's a new settlement with some new people and a new problem and you solve it and you walk away again. So there's a whole, you know, it runs the whole, you could do a whole bunch of different stuff. And then because it's a post-apocalyptic, there'll be, you know, science bases and military yeah. bases. You find. So yeah, there's a, there's a ton you, lot you can do with it. Um, I mean, on that sense, it's probably not super original, but it was just cool and a bit, a bit different. And uh, there you go. So yeah, check it out. It's interesting. I, I actually, that that sounds, and it sounds like you could dial up more serious, less yeah. serious, grittier, a little less. You could do that within the same story. Very cool. All 100%. right. I have, I have never heard of that. And now I'm at least moderately interested in watching it since we have Netflix. I feel like of, of all the 10 things I've got, that's the most obscure. I think all, all, most of the other ones are like ones I've already mentioned previously or ones people will have heard of. That I have heard of all like, but two of yeah. three of those. <laughs> that's This is by far the most obscure. One. All right. But, I like that though. Starting point. I'm quite all glad right. that came up first. Actually. I think mean, that was a good starting point. Right. What are you, uh, what are you bringing to us? All right. I have... Um... I have a literary, uh, well, uh, hardly. I have a fiction source. How's that? It's not literature. Um, it's literature for me, but uh, <laughs> it's Janissaries. Janissaries was a th it was a trilogy written by a science fiction author named Jerry Pornell, P O U R N E L L E, and I'll put links to this. Jerry Pornell wrote the three books, the three Janissaries books, which are also called the Tran T R A N um, series, and it's. Um, Pornell died a couple of years ago. Uh, the books were written, I think, in the 80s, and they've been printed. You, you can buy them individually. You can buy them as a brick where it has like all the, the books. In. Anyway, Jerry Pornell, Janissaries is the series. Um, it's okay. It's really wazoo. And I'll, uh, I'll just, uh, I'll, I'll, I'm just going to get that out of the way. It's totally wazoo. The, the root of the story is that there is a group of CIA funded mercenaries fighting some wretched uh, bush war in Africa. Like it sounds like uh, like 1970s Angola or something like that. Um, and I think they're, they are. I think that the book, the first book opens with them fighting like, you know, Cuban advisors or something like That's, that. Sounds like the start of Predator. Yeah, it, it, something along those lines. It's like there's this group of mercenaries, like a company of mercenaries. Um, small company, large platoon, something like that. <clears throat> I forget the exact numbers, but they're fighting in this wretched um, bush war and they're about to be overrun, okay? And out of the blue appears this like super high-tech uh, 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 aircraft. At least that's what they think it is. It lands like a flying saucer. Hmm. It lands and it's their, it's their means of escape. 
Okay, so they all pile on board this thing thinking, oh my golly, this is some kind of like secret CIA, you know, whatever that's getting <laughs> us out of here. Um, it flies them to the dark side of the moon. And yeah, it gets better. Flies them to the dark side of the moon and where they learn, and there's a human pilot, um, but what, what they learn is that they have been kidnapped by this interstellar drug cartel. I'm just making it as simple as possible. They've been kidnapped by an interstellar drug cartel, and they are going to be transported to this distant planet where every, I think it's every 600 years, a rogue star comes through its system and for a couple of years enables the growth of this plant that is harvested for some kind of like galactic heroin or something like that. <laughs> so they're drug dealers. And what this, what this, out, the, these, this cartel does is every 600 years or so, they kidnap a group of humans who are like the technologically most advanced warriors of a sort. And then they dump them on this planet and say like, we'll supply you if you manage the growth of this stuff. There's a lot more to the story. Okay. Uh, and so what happens is they show up on this planet and they become like this small group of like, you know, the most technologically advanced humans on this world with multiple populations of humans that have been dumped there every 600 years. So dial back, you have a bunch of Scottish Highlanders. You have, I forget what the, I think there might be Vikings or something like that. Um, they're Romans. They're all these civilizations from every, like, I think it's about every 600 years in human history that have been brought there and all the warped and weird growth that they've experienced culturally and politically and technologically as they've stayed on. Uh, and so there's a great deal. There's, there's fighting, there's action, there's a lot of intrigue. There's a lot of like diplomacy and politicking and, you know, parts of this mercenary group um, splinter. Some of them join one faction and another joins another faction and, and on from there. Um, like I said, originally it was a trilogy and the, the, the trilogy ended with the um, the leader of the mercenaries learning through you know various means learning that when the drugs get harvested and this rogue star is coming through the aliens always like bomb the humans back into not so much the stone age but like into submission and then the humans have to like hide hunker down while this rogue star comes around for several years. Uh, and so he is in the position of trying to figure out like how can we break the cycle and and like you know win against these aliens i only read the first three books and there were only three books for a long for the longest time pornell was writing a fourth book and then died and his son i only came to learn this recently um actually when i was thinking about this his son wrote in um 2020 a fourth book which is 608 pages and has like 4.8 stars out of five and over a thousand ratings on Amazon. So I am interested in reading the fourth book. I read the other books like 25, 30 years ago or something like that. Um, but, uh, but I liked the series because it was a combination of a bunch of things that felt real and plausible. Okay. Like the crazy alien technology was something that was periodically inflicted on the characters or the characters witnessed. It wasn't something that they wielded. So they dealt with 20th century and 14th century. And, you know, they, they dealt with technology from he, throughout human history up to, you know, contemporary times, the 1970s. So there was nothing, there was no like magic, whether it's technology or whether it's actually magic, there was nothing that the author was able to, um, to write off making sense of a story by saying, well, it's magic or something like that. And he never did anything like that with the technology from the aliens. So I like the fact that it was a great combination of it. There's, there's, there's action, there's intrigue. Um, there's plausible, you know, I like, remember, did you see that movie, the Martian? Uh, where he's stuck on somewhere With else. Matt Damon. Yeah. Yeah. I read yes. the book. I saw the movie. And, and one of the intriguing parts of it was the problem solving. You know, you have this character and he's trying to solve this ongoing series of problems. Some of them he foresees, some of them he gets slapped with. Um, 
good survival stories offer that. They put the protagonists in a position where they can plan for things, but then the unknown happens and they have to be clever and they have, you know, so there's that too, because as they manage their resources, like how they manage their, their, their people and how do they politic with the, how do they politic with the Romans? How do they politic with the Scots or not even the Romans, rather the people who descended from the Romans who were yanked out of Rome you know, 1800 years ago or something like that. Ditto for the Scots. I think it's, I think they're Scots. Um, anyway, uh, and the author, Pornell has, Pornell wrote a lot of uh, military science fiction, um, but apparently he used to like lecture at West Point, U.S. Military yeah. Academy. Like the guy clearly understood uh, tactics and strategy at the military level and then the, the relationship to an extent with politics. And so he writes a very plausible story and the behaviors of individuals within groups, individuals as individuals and groups against one another all reads very plausibly. And I like that. So it's in a weird way, like if you dig alternate history, this has strong elements of alternate history because like what would happen if you took several hundred Romans at the height of the Roman Empire and like plunk them on some planet? Like what would they develop in an Earth-like planet? What would they develop into? And then if they bumped in, you know, if then if like Scots or some kind of like middle Middle Ages like warrior types showed up, how would they how would they relate to one another and add six hundred years culturally? Like what would what would happen to them individually? And like what would their mutant like social their children be like if they ended up you know combining in some way? And so he creates a really plausible, interesting story and then plunks these mercenaries down in it uh so it's it's a great like i said it's totally wazoo i mean aliens can please you know it's it, it's it's beyond ridiculous but that's what the, you just, once you set that aside everything makes sense it's very cool um i think it would be a great game i think for obvious reasons like if you like i mean if you like well i hate rifts i don't like kitchen sink stuff but if you like wow. kitchen sink stuff, <laughs> minus magic and minus like hyper technology, this is it. You know, what happens when you have the gun wielding mercenaries going against, um, you know, a Roman, uh, you know, Roman legionnaires, but it's not like the gun wielding mercenaries can just rock and roll because they're going to run out of ammunition yeah. eventually. So they have to shepherd their own resources. And like, what do you do when, you know, how would culturally like, Scottish leaders, I think, again, I think they're Scots, relate to like an American who has a more like egalitarian view of things. Like I work within a command structure, but I also have a, a different baseline view of like one individual vis-a-vis -vis another. Uh, if you like politics and intrigue as well as action and sneaking around and investigation, I think investigation is probably the least of it. But if you like that, that if you if you like a story for players, for characters rather, that offers all of those things, I think that it would be, it would be really great. So would it actually, because obviously this, I can see that there's a setting, but it seems like there's a this story. So that it, that, would there be more for the characters to do than this, what, what the story in the books essentially? Okay, well here, I, I thought about, I thought about this. Uh, you could, you could do this a couple of different ways. If you just read the original trilogy, which obviously is all I've got to go on, and you just said, oh, that's cool, I want to run that. You could plunk down, you could say, all right, character players, you're going to be Romans, or you're going to be the, this, or that, you know, you could pick one of the different groups of people and have them be that, and then have the mercenaries show up, and how do you deal with that? Or, I mean, I think the easiest way, obviously, is you make them the mercenaries yeah. and they show up um, and then it becomes something where they've got to try to manage. You know, you could it, it's it is a um, to call it obscure, uh, you know, Janissaries, the book came out. I'm looking on Amazon here. I don't know. Seven, 1979. Uh, yeah. So the chances of a of a, a a contemporary group of players having a heard of it, b read it, is like nothing. So you could just you could just use this as a campaign. You just get the books, read through the books, uh, and just run it, and uh, and that's it. You know, no one. I I I think that that yeah, you could you could do that easily. 
Um, but the the meta plot, the idea of like, okay, these aliens show up periodically and they dump supplies on you so that you can be organizationally and, and in terms of fighting, like you can be something of the top of the heap or at least like the, the chief organizing entity on this world so that you can do the job of, of seeing to it that this these drug crops are grown and um, and harvested. Uh, you can use that as a, you know, a, a way to push periodically the, the players into action. Or, you know, you could weigh off and just, you know, that, that whole rogue star could show up, you know, many years from now or just dump it. Well, then there's no real reason. There's no reason unless there's that. But you, you can prod the players. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I've even gone to the extent of like thinking about like what system might I use uh, for this, depending on what kind of tone. Do I want it more like a little grittier and more survival-ish with some resource management at the individual and at the group level. I think there, there are systems that there was one system in particular that I thought of that I think would be really good for it. If you wanted to run it more like, like action and intrigue, another system I would use. Um, but yeah, I, 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 I think I'm going to pick up the, uh, this fourth book, um, you know, and see how they see how the son, uh, takes his, his father's unfinished book, finishes it. And, uh, offers up maybe an end to the to the story yeah sounds cool it's funny listening to that i was thinking like oh military survival well that's twilight 2000 yeah, which totally. is then funny because kipo the most obvious thing is muted year zero yeah so they're both using the same system a good point well variations of the same system at some yeah. point we need to really sit down and dive a lot more into the free league stuff yeah yeah you know, to, to see one of the systems, if I wanted to run this and I wanted to run it grittier and with more resource management and frankly, not have to worry much about modifying anything like there are no there are there are I think if I remember correctly, there are some like weird native animals, but there's nothing really fantastical like you don't have to make room mechanically for magic or dragons or something like that. So I think you could you could pretty much run Twilight 2000 like out of the box. No yeah. problem. If I was going to run this with a little more uh, swinging from the chandeliers, I would just use 2D20. Um, I would just use Octone Cthulhu because Octone Cthulhu has all the weapons. Um, heck, if you just looked at the uh, the, the quick start for uh, Cohorse Cthulhu, you have, you know, if you if you want that, those combat system options versus Octone Cthulhu, go with either of them and, and you're good to go. And you have stats for... Armored Legionnaires, and you have stats for like you know uh, barbarian types in in Germany. So that would be easy to modify those. And you're like, oh, that's a man at arms from the year fourteen hundred. Well, the other option, still sticking with two D twenty, is Fallout because oh, totally because it, it has survival rules. Yeah. Um, what it doesn't have, even though they had it, is that it doesn't. One of the Fallout things was like I think it was the one set in Vegas where basically they were Roman ran it as a Roman yeah. people like that. Um, in fact, Fallout would also work for parts of Keeper, which is quite funny. So, yeah, depending on that's a good point. Depending on the the overall like the 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 campaign foundation, um, yeah, depending on the campaign foundation, that that you could you'd pick one of those one of those systems. Well, cool. I will put links in the notes to Keepo and to Janissaries on Amazon. And uh, you know what? What we would love on YouTube or um, on our Discord, and there's a link in the show notes and on YouTube to the uh, to our Discord. If you've got properties, especially obscure stuff, um, that you think would be good from mining or stealing wholesale uh, for game ideas, either for stories like I'm running this story within an established world or as the setting, share them. I would love to hear them, and I know that other people would benefit from them as well. Yeah, totally. All right. Everyone have a fine week. Thank you so much for listening. You can visit our show's homepage at anchor.fm slash fluff and crunch. That's F-L-U-F-F-N-C-R-U-N-C-H. We would really appreciate feedback and reviews on whatever podcasting platform you're listening to this on. Thanks so much.